students, colleagues, students, and members of the extended UB community. It brings us great joy uh, that we at the Department of History and Archaeology at the American University of Beirut continue to perpetuate this tradition of hosting the Kamal Salibi Memorial Lecture and continue to bring to the AUB community scholars and historians of the highest reputation. This year, of course, is no exception, as we are truly delighted to have Selim Derenge, a distinguished scholar of, late Ottoman, of the late Ottoman period at Boazici University in Istanbul, and the man we are proud to, all, to call one of our own. Despite being a native of Istanbul, which once graced our part of the Islamic Near East with its suzerainty over us, my words, not his, Professor Deringel has happily adopted Beirut as a second home, and he also taught at both the UB and LAU in the recent past. Professor Deringel, as I've already mentioned, needs no introduction in the field of Ottoman and Turkish studies, especially the later period of Ottoman history. His book on the Hamidian period, entitled The Well-Protected Domains, remains unquestionably the leading work of its kind and on its subject. He was also notably the first scholar to offer a treatment of a particular and peculiar aspect of religiosity and religious life in an ideologically modernized Ottoman Empire in his fantastic 2012 book entitled Conversion and Apostasy in the Late Ottoman Empire. In recent years, Professor Deringer has also adjusted his geographical gaze somewhat by looking more at the Arab provinces of the Ottoman Empire. His current book project, I am sure, is of interest to all of us here, as he is working on completing a monograph on late Ottoman Lebanon. And this book, if his earlier scholarship is anything to go by, should prove an instant classic and an indispensable contribution to the subfields of Lebanese, modern Arab, and late Ottoman history. So without further ado, let us all give a big UB welcome back to Salim Dering. Okay, uh, this is indeed, uh, it feels like home. I've actually spoken in this room twice before. Uh, and it is indeed a great honor to be asked to give the Kamal Salibi Memorial Lecture this year. And I would like to thank the History Department of AUP for this opportunity. The House of Many Mansions was actually the first book that I read on Lebanese history, and it was recommended by my dear friend, the late Dr. Abdul Rahim Abu Hussein, whom we all miss very much. I was also introduced to Dr. Salibi by Dr. Abu Hussein during my first visit to AUP in 2000, and had the pleasure of being invited to his home during a subsequent visit in 2007. I will always remember his charm and erudition. As to the Druze, I was asking myself, when did I hear the word for the first time? And I remember um, when I was seven or eight years old, I was parked with my grandparents quite often. And I was very fond of them. But I was a rather naughty little boy. And when I was particularly naughty, my grandfather used to point a finger at me and go, Druze, Druze. So I went up to my grandma and I said, uh, Grandma, what does this word mean? And she smiled sweetly and she said, it means troublemaker, dear. Of all the communities of Lebanon, the Druze relations with the Ottomans remain probably the most ambivalent. And that is why, because of my fascination with them, that a large part of the current book is devoted to the Ottoman relations with the Druze. The late great scholar Kamal Salibi has successfully put paid to the legend of Selim I, Sultan Selim I, investing Fahrettin Man with the title of Sultan al-Bar or the Druze Emirates. We read in the House of Many Mansions, quote, firstly, there was no Druze Emirate, 
in the sense of a dynastic principality to be taken from one dynasty and given to another. Moreover, to the Ottomans at the time, no Druze could be trusted. After the institution of the Tanzimat reforms, the Ottomans created a entirely specific category for the Druze and calling them Druzi or Druz in the plural, setting them off from Sunni and Shia Muslims. And uh, this is a wonderful drawing from the London Illustrated uh, News uh, of Daud Pasha. And the, this is from the journal itself. Daud Pasha, Governor General of Mount Lebanon, the first Christian Pasha nominated by the ports. I really like these drawings. You can see he has his uh, book, he has his decorations and everything. And the census on the right here uh, is a census that is supposed to have been taken at the time of Daud Pasha in, 16, uh, in, in 1868. Now, I'm not sure about this document, I have to say, because I haven't seen any subsequent references to it. Uh, it was given to me by a student of mine at the LAU, who said it was among his family's papers. So I will definitely take it with a grain of salt. What I, the reason I'm using it here is because you can see, uh, circ circled in red, the very definite category of Duru's uh, as part of the breakdown of the uh, various taife of Lebanon uh, in, in, at the time. Now, this is the outline of uh, the reforms. Uh, this is the outline of the paper I'm going to share with you today. One, the Kaimakamiya as the official recognition of the Druze. Two, the Mutasarrifiya and the quote unquote correction of the beliefs of the Druze of Mount Lebanon and Hauran. Three, the Ottoman efforts to prevent Druze migration from Lebanon to Hauran and the Union of the Lebanese and Hauran Druze. And four, finally, I will briefly address the military campaign of 1910 and World War I. During the Ottoman centuries, the Druze were a constant worry for Istanbul. And indeed, Dr. Abdurrahim Abu Hussein actually speaks of what he called a long rebellion for the entire period of Ottoman rule. Nonetheless, by the 19th century, the Druze of Mount Lebanon and the Ottomans, this is my conclusion, I, I, I firmly believe this, actually needed each other. Surrounded by other and sometimes hostile religious groups, the Druze leadership by the 19th century had to find some accommodation with the Ottoman state. The Ottoman state, on the other hand, needed the Druze on the Lebanese mountain as a Muslim counterweight to the Christians. Thus, the migration of the Druze of Mount Lebanon to Hauran worried the Ottomans, especially after the 1860s, and this is something I will deal with later on in my talk today. In this paper, I will examine the relationship of the Druzes, since how, how it evolved, my takeoff date is, is 1840 and the Kaimakamiya period. The institution of the Kaima Kamiya in 1843, with the institution of the Kaima Kamiya in 1843, the Ottomans tried to establish their direct rule over Lebanon for the first time. The, uh, the fact that the Emirate had been abolished after the uh, exile of Shihab II uh, seemed to give them this opportunity after the withdrawal also of the Egyptians. Nevertheless, they also recognized the Druze as such with the creation of one of the two Kaimakamiya of the period, specifically as the Druze Kaimakamiya. The reglement of Shekib Efendi, named after this gentleman, a foreign minister of the Ottoman state at the time. By the way, the fact that the Ottomans took this uh, area very seriously is shown by the fact that they twice sent their foreign ministers to the region. 1840 was Shekib Efendi, and in 1860 was Fuad Pasha, whom we will see in, in the coming couple of month, uh, minutes. 
The very first article of the Reglement of Sheikh Efendi, there are 39 articles, and I've read all of them, specifically mentions, quote, regulations pertaining to the changes in the duties of the two councils recently established in the two Kaimakamates of Jabal Lubna, establishing, establishing the appointment of members and spheres of responsibility, spheres of responsibility of the, of the Maronite and Druze councils as established by Imperial Ferma. This is actually the very first article in the Reglement. In many ways, the effort to establish Ottoman direct rule in Lebanon after 1840 became something of a pilot project for the application of Tanzimat principles, which emphasized the rule of law based on centralization and representation where each community was, uh, was represented. And in fact, it was the first, it was in fact the first official recognition of what we call the Taifia system, what we call uh, the sectarian system, where each sect had a specific quota of representation in the councils. Shekib Efendi's project ultimately failed as Lebanon became what one Ottoman official described as the battleground, Maidan Amarake, of international or interimperial power struggles in the Levant, the so called Eastern Question, a term that I hate. After the Haraka of 1841, the Druze were accused of looting Christian property. Druze sheikhs were called to account before the so called Indemnity Tribunal, now Indemnity D1, where Christian indemnity claims were to be discussed. The report of the British Consul General, who was present in the Duma, Colonel Hugh Rose, dated 23rd March 1843, is worth citing at length. And I quote, the indemnity Diwan closed two days ago the investigation of the losses of the inhabitants of Dair al Amar. The Emir Ahmad Arslan, the Druze Kaimakam, who can easily adopt any religion because he has never been supposed to have had any, to better his position and that of his countrymen, two days ago declared himself a Muslim in a full sitting of the Diwan, holding up his hands and repeating the necessary formula of Islamism. The superior Turkish authorities, having been duped last year by a conversion of the Druzes to Mohammedanism, feigned for self-interest, it remains to be seen whether they would attach much value to a second and still more interested profession of their faith. Asad Pasha, in the investigation of the affair at Beit Meri, told the accused Druzes, who wished to nullify the Christian evidence by declaring themselves Muslims, that they were hypocrites for so doing, and that they had before affected proselytism. The Emir Ahmad, to prove still more his sincerity, added, I curse every religion except the Mohammedan one. The ground for the conversion of Emir Ahmad became evident where he proceeded to argue that the claims of the Christians could not be maintained because they were only supported by their oaths, their, their oaths, which were of no value against the Druzes who had become Muslims. End of quote. Sheikh Ahmad was told by the two senior Ottoman members of the Diwan that the new system, in the new system of the Tanzimat, the testimony of Christian and Muslim were accepted equally. This was the penal code, or that would have been the penal code of 1840. Now, an essential part of using the Druze as a counterweight to Christians in Mount Lebanon was to try to convert them to Sunni Islam. Now, this was a highly problematic process because the Druze were already officially Muslims, and there was no guarantee that they would be more reliable or pliable after the supposed conversion. The first such attempt was made in the time of Omar Pasha's governorship in early 1842. Omar Pasha was the first Ottoman governor that, the, uh, that Istanbul sent to, to Lebanon uh, after the Haraka. Omar Pasha himself uh, is quite an interesting character. He's known in this area, of course, as al Nimsawi, the Austrian, which in fact is wrong. He was Serbian, and he was a convert to Islam as a young man, 
and he rose up through the ranks of the Ottoman military to actually ultimately become the, the, the overall the commander in chief of the Ottoman forces during the Crimean War. Not bad for a young Serbian convert. Now, Omar Pasha invited Muslim ulama to come to Lebanon to instruct the Druze in the, what he called the true Islamic faith. The ulama required the dissolution of the Druze Ukkal, the holy caste, and the destruction of the Halwas. Of course, this did not happen, and it could not have happened. The Civil War of 1860 in Mount Lebanon and the massacre of Christians at Damascus were an extreme embarrassment to the Ottoman state because the much vaunted Tanzimat reform seemed to have failed utterly and foreign intervention in the shape of French military force arrived. The general uh, Utful with about 12,000 French troops landed in Beirut in August. 1860. This left the Ottomans in a, in a bind, wandering in the mountain. They had to punish the Druze because they were seen as the main culprits of the war for massacring Christians. And of course, also the Turkish troops were supposed to be involved, so they also had to clear their name. Yet on the other hand, if Druze power was effaced from the mountain, the mountain would, would become entirely Christian and under the dominant sects of the Maronites, that is to say, entirely under French influence. Fouad Pasha, the Ottoman foreign minister, openly declared to the French, his French counterparts, we cannot leave the Christians in the mountain and in the Sahel without some counterweight. During the trials of the Druze leaders, Fouad wrote to Istanbul that, quote, what the Christians really want is the execution of the entire Druze race. Failing that, they want to expel them from the mountain. Leila Fawaz, uh, in her, uh, one of her many excellent articles, has pointed out that Fuad Pasha, together with the British commissioner in the Commission of Inquiry, Lord Deferin, uh, actually saved many of these Druze sheikhs from execution because the French and the Maronites and other Christians were out for their blood. After the civil war and the, Ma and the Damascus massacres, actually no Druze leader was actually put to death. There were no executions of Druze sheikhs, even, even though many of the tribunals had passed death sentences on them. Said Jumla, who was seen as a ringleader, was condemned to death, but his sentence was commuted to life imprisonment through the intervention of Fuad and Lord Deferin, and he actually died in prison because he was already very ill. Most leading sheikhs were exiled and eventually returned, recovering some of their land and property. Now I want to move on to the Mutasarrifi period and the correction of the beliefs, in quotes, of the Druze of Mount Lebanon. Soon after the establishment of the Mutasarrifiya, the Ottomans began a policy of attempting to heal old wounds and apply the reforms of the Tanzimat. This is, here we see Fuad Pasha, probably one of the most brilliant Ottoman statesmen of the 19th century. He even wrote poetry in French, rather bad poetry. In French, but... Okay, the mosque of Dair al Amar was repaired in the same year as the institution of the Reglement of Jabal Lubnan. So the, the, the Reglement of Jabal Lubnan was passed in 1861. The mosque of uh, Dair al-Amar was restored and repaired in the same year as a sort of lieu de mémoire, referring to recent events. The mosque was intended as a reminder of the power of the Sultan over the mountain and over Dair al-Amar as its capital and symbolic, it had symbolic value for both the Druzes and the Maronites, of course. Yet, the symbolism was not quite the same for the two groups. It is a reminder of Islamic identity of the Ottoman state. It is also a reminder to the Druze of their original Islamic identity when they used to build mosques. Moreover, it is a gesture for the renewal of the mythical historical alliance, mythical as shown by Kamal Salibi, 
between the Ottoman state and the Druze under the leadership of Fahreddin I. Two commemorative plaques appear on the mountain. And here is one of them on the right. It reads, uh, the, the one on the right reads, uh, Jami al-Amir Fahreddin al-Mani al-Awwal. Sorry about my awful pronunciation. The other is a commemorative plaque written in the format of a chronogram in Turkish. And this is the full version uh, that a friend of mine and I translated from Ottoman Turkish. And I've only taken two, uh, two lines which I think are the most significant. It says, His Majesty Sultan Abdulaziz, leader of the Sunnis, he ordered and commanded that this mosque be repaired. He deserves to be called the father of Muslims for this. O attendant, pray for its first builder. May God grant his soul happiness in paradise. And this, of course, is a reference to Fahret bin Ma'an the first and the, the, uh, the reader of the, of the Kitabah is invited to pray for his soul. Soon after the establishment of the Mutasarrafiya regime, the first Mutasarraf, Daud Pasha, whom we've already met, established schools, special schools in the, Druze, in the Druze districts of Lebanon. In an early report from 1862, Daud pointed out that, quote, although the Christian children of the mountain have schools established by the French, the Druze have no such schools, and this causes them to lag behind their fellow, their Christian fellow citizens. The word used here is significant, the use of the word batandash, which means citizen, even today, and of course, the idea of an Ottoman citizenry uh, of all sects was one of the main uh, aspects of the Tanzimat discourse at the time, and it appears time and again. The aim was to teach Turkish and other languages. The aim was to teach Turkish and other languages. There was no mention of the correction of the beliefs. And Daoud's report claimed that the appeal to establish such a school actually came from the Druze, who are the Ukkals and Sheikhs themselves. The school would be supervised by what he called a respected Druze notable. And he had made arrangements for the local the Druze Ukkals and feudal lords for the grant of the land for the school and to cover the expenses through the vakaf like foundations established by the Druze community. Daoud had gone to Abe himself and chosen the location of the school together with the leaders of the Druze community whom he praised for their dedication to education. Another measure undertaken by the Ottomans at this time was to attempt to flatter and co-opt the notables. In 1868, Mustafa Arslan was appointed as member of the very prestigious Council of State, Shurai Devlet, at the Sublime Port, and given the higher rank, Rutte Ula. This appointment had evoked the jealousy of the Maronite community, and their patriarch, Bulos Masad, had told the Mutasarraf, Frango Pasha, that the Maronites felt excluded and were offended. And Frango actually recommended to Istanbul that at some future date, when there was an opening, a Maronite should also be appointed to the Council of State. Um, Bulos Masad, of course, is important also because he's the first Maronite patriarch to actually visit Istanbul and uh, be received by the Sultan. Frango Pasha proposed in 1870 to the port that the Rushdie Middle School be opened in, at Iklim al Harub near Saida, as there was, he said, quote, a need to teach the Druze people the precepts of the Sharia and the Muslim faith. End of quote. The port was favorable to the idea of the creation of such a school, quote, which would remove the ignorance of the people. Frango was instructed to look for a suitable location and estimate the expense. Rustam Pasha. His successor, replaced Frango in 1873, he would also initiate improvements in education. According to Dahir al-Akiki, in his chronicle, quote, the Azizia school at Indair al-Amar, the name being, of course, significant, Sultan Aziz, employing six teachers, the largest in Lebanon, excepting the Daudia school in Beit ed din and a similar one in Abe for the Druze sect. 
Now I want to move on to the Ottoman efforts to prevent Jews' migration from Lebanon to Hauran and the union of the Lebanese and Hauran. As the relatively more ecumenical and tolerant political atmosphere of the Tanzimat yielded to Hamidian authoritarianism in the 1880s, Abdul Hamid II, the policy of enforcing the official Sunni Hanafi orthodoxy and the conversion of those who, quote unquote, lived in a state of nomadism and savagery, title of an article that I published some years ago, this policy became more intense. Thus the Druze, especially those of the Hauran, became part of the process of the quote-unquote correction of the beliefs, tasfihi akaid, as it was called, whereby people who were seen as heterodox or heretic, such as the Yazidi Kurds, Alevis, and even Bedouin, were targeted for conversion to Sunni Hanafi orthodoxy. With the increasing Druze numbers and power in the Hauran, the Druze of Mount Lebanon and the Vilayet of Beirut came to be seen as actually more civilized, the word is used in the document is actually medani, and reliable than their turbulent brethren in Hauran. So there's beginning to be this distinction between the mountain uh, the Jews and the Vilayet of Beirut after 1888 and Hauran. This led to a policy that has been named the Ottomanization of the Hauran Druze. The policy of the Ottomanization of the Hauran Druze was based on the classic imperial tactic of divide and rule, whereby some Druze sheikhs would be co-opted into working with the authorities, while others were seen as adversaries or even enemies. Of course, these, these characters could shift from one to the other. One of the leading sheikhs, Ibrahim Atrash, who collaborated with the Ottomans in the 1890s, was mockingly dubbed by his brother, Alatrash, Abu Tarbush, referring to the fess, uh, the headgear that became the symbol of all things Ottoman. And here we have a photograph of Shibli Alatrash. I love the body. Uh, Druze chieftain and Ottoman Kaimakam of Ara near Sueda in 1895. This title comes from uh, the source, which is in the Berlin Staatlicher Museum. And of course, Shibli was also Kaimakam, but he could also be on the other side, depending on how circumstances suited him. Although the Ottoman documents sent from Syria in the 1890s claimed that the, whenever halwas were turned into mosques, this was done at the request and with the full agreement of the Druze, this is highly unlikely. The local officials made a point of insisting that all of the opening ceremonies of converted halwas were timed to coincide with auspicious occasions, like the Eid holiday, the Sultan's birthday, and where prayers were said for the long life and health of the Sultan. This is very likely a propaganda move. Statements like this have to be taken with a very large pinch of salt because uh, anyone who works in the Ottoman archives will know that very often of officials in the field wrote what they thought the Sultan wanted to hear, especially if it was someone who was as paranoid as Abdul Hamid II. In a report written in 1897, the Vali of Syria, Hussein Nazim Pasha, very prominent Vali at the time, pointed out, quote, the difference between the civilized demeanor of the Druze of the Jabal and Beirut and the continuing savagery of those here in Syria is entirely due to the fact that the former are educated and the latter remain in a state of nomadism and ignorance. Again, the famous formula. The Pasha stressed that he knew from personal experience from his time as Vali of Beirut, he had also served as Vali of Beirut, that the Druze notables of Beirut were good Muslims. And, quote, when one of them has re was recently deceased, his funeral prayer was performed in the big mosque in Beirut. He bemoaned the fact that, quote, military measures are not enough. Military measures alone are not enough. Nor is it enough merely to stick a few minarets on the halwas. The only solution, he said, was, the correction of the beliefs, the tashihi akaid. A long report, and there are many such reports, uh, and they are you know, some of them are very long and very detailed. But it would be if it were A4 paper, sometimes they go on for eight or ten pages with very closely, densely written rika. This was a report uh, presented to the Yildiz Palace in 1886 by a certain Ahmed Izzet, 
who is the chief judge of the court of first instance in Istanbul. So he's a jurist. It comprises both gross distortions and an accurate rendition of the Druze struggle for autonomy under Ottoman rule, focusing particularly on Hauran. He opens by making a striking declaration, stating that, quote, the Druze belief was a religion unto itself, which means that he denies that the Druze are a sect of Islam. He continues by saying that, quote, they believe that the lives and goods of all other peoples are forfeit, halal, unto them until they all become Druze. Ahmed Izzet also saw the solution in education and integration into the Ottoman system, but not in Syria. He says, Druze children should be trained and brought up in a suitably Islamic manner, and those among them that show promise should be appointed as officials in, prom in provinces far from Syria. This will ensure that the security of Syria. Ahmed Izzet also declared that the Hauran Druze cannot do anything conclusive unless they unite with, with their brethren in Mount Lebanon. And this had to be prevented at all costs. After the Civil War of 1860, more and more Druze, who had never really recovered their former power after the war, left the Lebanese mountain for Hauran, which actually came to be called Jebel Druze in the, in, 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 at, after 1860. And we have to remember that Jebel Druze before was here, uh, northern Lebanon. And on this map, uh, on Ottoman map of Lebanon and Syria, uh, done in 1829, you can see in the red circle, there's very clearly indicated Durzi, which on more or less what is today Lebanon. Um, so this potential union of the mountain Druze and the Hauran Druze was something that the Ottoman authorities wanted to prevent at all costs, if possible. As the only disciplined armed Muslim group in the mountains, the Druze were simply too valuable. Because to lose them would mean abandoning the mountain to the Christians. Throughout the 19th century, Ottoman valis and mutasarrifs sought to curtail such migration. Also, a swelling of their numbers in the province of Syria would cause problems. There are numerous references to periodic scares of this happening. For example, on the 9th of April, 1886, the Mutasarraf Vasa Pasha, one of the most famous Mutasarrafs who's actually buried here in Hazmiye, reported that following his instructions, he had, quote, renewed his measures to prevent, renewed the measures to prevent the joining of the Druze of Mount Lebanon with those in Hauran. For the time being, he said, there was no need to take military measures given the general political conditions and the delicate position of Mount Lebanon. This uh, is an indicate is these two maps are, I think, interesting. This is a, a, a geological map of Palestine showing here, is the cursor working? Uh, Hauran here and the Laja Desert. Now, the Laja Desert, of course, was very important for the Druze people because it was a natural fortress. It's marked here on the map as Oolithic Rock, whatever that means. But it means it's very, 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 very tough territory. And it's almost like a natural fortress. And this was where the Druze forces trapped numerous intruding armies, starting with the Egyptians and subsequently several Ottoman armies. So they tried to prevent them taking refuge here. Causing the Druze to emigrate was indeed a detrimental stigma for Mutasarraf. When Vasa was accused in 1887 by the Valley of Syria of, quote, forcing the Druze of the Shuf to emigrate to Auran, he reposted energetically that this was, quote, the result of lies and intrigues by Emir Mustafa Arslan who had been dismissed from his position as Kaimakam of the Shuf. He also stated that moving of populations across the borders of the Mutasarrafi to neighboring vilayets was something that had always happened for economic reasons, because there was not enough agricultural land in the Mutasarrafi, so people very often went to other parts of, of the area for uh, agricultural reasons. Um, and to, and to, prevent, to present this, he said, as a recent development, 
is purely the result of lies and deceit. Mustafa Arslan and his followers, uh, Vasa pointed out, were acting out of spite. They had been, he said, quote, fooling the simple people by telling them that if they emigrated to Hauran, they would be given ample land and exempted from taxation. In 1887, again, the Valley of Syria reported that he had heard rumors to the effect that the Druze of the Shuf had asked their brethren in the Hauran to send them 1,000 camels to bear their belongings during their migration. He added, quote, the special character of the Druze is well known, and their concentration in an area as sensitive of the, as the Hauran is worrisome to the state referring to the repeated uprisings and con con continuing turbulence of the Hauran. He said, secret investigations should be carried out about this affair, and that the local officials in the mountain should be instructed to tell the Druze not to carry out their plans. Now, the fact that the local authorities were to carry out secret investigations and simply tell the Druze, don't do this, right, is to change their minds, indicates that there was very little they could actually do, short of undertaking military measures, which would be extremely destabilizing and costly and often counterproductive. Now, here I want to point something out which might be a bit surprising. The Druze, in my view, actually used the possibility of migration to Hauran almost as a sort of blackmail against the Ottomans, who could not actually curtail such migration. The mountain, the Ottomans, in the mountain, the Ottomans could not use forceful measures as they had in the Hauran, such as the destruction of the Halwas or the forced conversion into mosques. The presence of the Christians, actually, on the mountain served as a bargaining counter that the Jews of Hauran did not have. A report underlining the indispensability of the Jews was written and presented to the palace in 1892 by Ferik Mehmed Emin Pasha, a high-ranking military. He stated, quote, the guarantee of Mount Lebanon remaining forever part of the imperial domains remains the Druze, who are loyal and loving subjects, compared to the Maronites, who are pro-French. The Pasha warned that the Druze could not on any account be forced to abandon the mountain by misguided policies of the government. He said, quote, as this would mean abandoning the mountain to the Maronites and would eventually lead to a situation such as in Bulgaria, which is semi-independent. This is a reference to the Bulgarian principality set up in these years, uh, which actually did create the, the nucleus of a future independent Bulgaria. Compared to the Druze of Hauran, the Druze of Mount Lebanon and the Vilayet of Beirut were much more integrated into local politics and alliances. Some Druze were actually instrumental in the attempted Ottomanization of the Hauran. Four Druze figures helped, to, helped the Ottomans, or tried to help the Ottomans achieve the same. Salim Naufal, a Druze sheikh from Haspaya, who was the official representative of the Druze community in the Hauran, in the province of Syria, and was charged with mediating between the Druze and the authorities. I mean, Arslan was Kaimakam of several parts of the province, and Shakib Arslan represented the Islamization of the Druze Mathab, which the Ottomans were hoping to achieve. And also, Said Bey Tahu served as Kaimakam in several Kazans of Syria. Now I want to come to the final part of my presentation, which is the military campaign of 1910 and the Great War. The Ottomans launched five campaigns. Now, the, one of the main Ottoman aims was to incorporate the Druze into the Ottoman armed forces, because here you had a, almost a ready-made military force. These guys were fighters. These guys knew how to, to ride, shoot, and so on. So in, to incorporate them into the military of the Ottomans was a great, great uh, advantage. So they launched five campaigns against the Ottoman uh, Druze in Hauran. 1879, 1881, 1884, and 1896. In 1910, they launched what amounted to the largest military campaign ever. Samir Saikhali, who is among us today, has shown that, quote, the Syrian opinion was overwhelmingly supportive of the Ottoman bid to pacify Hauran. 
According to Cyclery, among the leading Jews of Lebanon, opinion was pro-Ottoman. Understandably, Amir Mustafa Arslan, very much part of the Ottoman establishment by 1910, argued that there was no cataclysmic dimension to the Druze uprising, and it was simply the result of Druze ignorance and conciliation rather than military action was the answer. Another Druze writer, Nasib Nakad, wrote that the Druze were, quote, rooted in their Ottoman identity and neither aspired for nor could they hope to achieve an independent political existence. This is again from Samir Zaykali's article. Another member of the Druze aristocracy, Amir Said Arslan, published what Zaykali cites as a withering attack against the leaders of the Hauran Rising, condemning their arrogance and warned them that, quote, the empire would ultimately crush them as duty ordained and the well-being of the Ottoman society required. Although the Ottoman campaign of 1910 ultimately succeeded, as soon as the troops pulled out, the area reverted back to its semi-autonomous status, and therefore the Ottomanization of the Hauran Druze was ultimately a failure. During the Great War, the Druze of Hauran were managed by Jamal Pasha, who was extremely wary of provoking them and desperately needed the grain coming from the Hauran. Uh, this photograph shows uh, on the left uh, Jamal, who is very well known uh, as infamous in this area. Uh, he, was, he was a great ham. He loved having his photograph taken. There were hundreds of pictures of him in various poses. Here he's shown uh, prominently displaying his iron cross. Uh, so the point is that the Ottomans never actually succeeded in one of their most cherished aims, and that is conscripting the Druze into the Ottoman army. A small contingent of Druze volunteers organized by Shakib Arslan, here in the background, joined the Ottoman forces during the Suez campaign, but they were never actually deployed. Shakib Arslan himself became the close collaborator of Jamal Pasha and came so, became so closely linked to his reign of terror that he had to leave Lebanon at the end of the war. Here he's shown in the background, Jim, he was he served as uh, the sort of uh, translator and general um, sort of gopher for Jamal in, in the area. In lieu of a conclusion, throughout the last 80 years of Ottoman presence in the geography that became Lebanon, the Druze and the Ottomans needed each other. Eventual British support for the Druze was nothing like the French support for the Maronites. It was tactical and temporary. And after the establishment of British rule in Egypt in 1882, dwindled to practically nothing, although the British did keep close tabs on what was happening in the Hauran. Ultimately, the Druze leadership of Lebanon came progressively to terms with the Ottoman power structure. After their official recognition in 1840, they integrated much more than Maronites, who had much more solid and historic ties with France, who actually saw them as a potential bridgehead for the eventual colonization of Syria. This, by the way, is also the view of most of the Ottoman officials at the time. This is how they see the Maronites. The Druze elites of Mount Lebanon and Beirut came to profit from the commercial, educational, and cultural opportunities much more directly than their brethren in Syria. They sent their children to here, Syria Protestant College, University of Saint Joseph. Uh, they, they participated in the commerce of a vibrant port city, Beirut itself. So, I'm to finish, no one's beliefs were actually corrected. And it is highly unlikely that the active Ottomanization of the Druze could ever have succeeded. The relationship of the Druze and the Ottomans can be compared to a marriage of convenience, where neither party is terribly happy with the arrangement, but put up with it nonetheless. I thank you.
As you wish, you do it. Okay, I'll take the uh, first question. Uh, it's a question of power politics. Uh, the British support, as far as I can see, for the, for the Druze was largely, for, as I said, purely tactical reasons. They supported the Druze because the French supported the Maronites, or rather the Maronites supported them. Okay? Uh, and as the century wore on, and imperial, imperial uh, sort of partition of Africa uh, became more and more intense. There was a sort of tit for tat between the French and the British. The French first took over Algeria in 1830, uh, then they moved in, and, and then the Italians ultimately took Libya in 1912. Uh, the French took Tunis in the 1880s, and the British, of course, very important, they were already established with the Suez Canal Company and so on in Egypt, but in 1882, as a reaction to the Urabi Pasha, uh, uprising, uh, they actually took over Egypt, and Egypt was never officially colonized, it was never called a colony, but that is in fact what happened. So after that, they didn't really need the Druze anymore. They kept the, they kept tabs on the Druze in Hauran, because that was Hauran, and that was Syria, and it was you know a different ball game. So that was the thing. But really, it was nothing like the French support for the Maronites, which goes back centuries. It was a tactical thing. For example, there were very few Druze who were, there were some, but there were very few Druze who actually became Protestant. Uh, Protestant missionaries worked in Druze regions. There was an important Protestant mission in Haspaya, for example. But there was never, it's never to the same scale as, as the French for the Mennonites. It's, um, as far as I can see, it really was a tactical alliance. To come back to, to, to answer the second gentleman, now, Faridin's uh, rule in the mountain was, as you probably said, as you said, very civilized and everybody was equal until they decided to kill each other. Um, so uh, that is, uh, in fact, uh, this is uh, you know, part of the official mythology, which I think we must be very careful about. Okay? Now, the, uh, the, um, the whole point about repairing this mosque was uh, the fact that you know, that it was the Ottomans were actually interestingly buying into this mythology of this, as Salib has shown, mythical alliance between Farid in the first and Selim the first, which never happened. Right? Uh, so this was a, a symbolic gesture in creating, like I said, a sort of lieu de memoir. And uh, and as the and because I mean they actually put a Turkish kitaba on the mountain. And who was to read this? Uh, but that was the uh, point. So we can take some more questions. The Ottomans behind killing each other. Well, actually, they weren't here. But by before 1840, there wasn't there wasn't really a direct Ottoman presence. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Well, I don't remember exactly what Salibi wrote, but as far as I remember, one or the other died before 1516, or either Fahreddin or uh, Selim the First. I think it was Fahreddin. He was too young. And also about uh, uh, so I mean we we love we love myths. Myths are nice. We want to believe in myths. We make it makes us they make us feel good. You know, when I was growing up in Turkish primary school, we were told that the ancestors of the Turks were the Hittites. Uh, so you know, this is all very nice. Uh, about autonomy, though, that's an important concept because throughout this whole period when the Ottomans are trying to establish what I call their direct rule during the Sheki Arslan period, for example, they keep coming up against this uh, res resistance, actually, from the locals, uh, Maronite Andrews, uh, about their autonomy. They keep saying, we want our autonomy. We were autonomous under the, uh, under the Shihab Emirate. So there's this constant reference to autonomy, and of course, Again, I have to refer to Salibi. Uh, this was also uh, largely a myth, because as far as the Ottomans were concerned, Bishir Shihab II was a, a tax farmer, a big one, right? But that's what he was, right? He was he was he was a mukataji, uh, like all the other mukatajis, right? He was a powerful mukataji, and they let him do what he wanted in the region as long as he didn't cause too many problems, right? And in fact, his religious identity something I didn't go into here, but it's also very you know, interesting. He was a Muslim to the Muslims. He was a Christian to the Christians. He didn't particularly care. But that's, that's a different, different story. Thank you for that. Okay, now you're completely right. Uh, the Druze did not inhabit Laja or that area by themselves. In fact, there was always one of the other Ottoman tactical moves was to try to prevent the alliance of the Druzes with the nomadic tribes at the time, with the Bedouin, uh, the nomadic tribes of the region, which they ultimately were not successful in doing because sometimes. The Jews would ally with the, no, with the nomads, and sometimes they would fight against them. So you're very right. And also the Circassians, uh, again, by the way, the Circassians were also uh, targeted for this correction of the beliefs. The Circassians were also seen as somewhat dubious in their Islamic identity. Um, I, I, 
if it's if you say it's lopsided, yeah, because I simply don't have time. I didn't have time to discuss all of those issues, but I really do believe that there was in, increasingly, at least in the Ottoman perception of things, a difference between the uh, dr the Druze of Lebanon, Mount Lebanon, and the and the Vilayet of Beirut and the Hauran. You're completely right about the Karak revolt. Again, you know, I can't. If I, if I were to talk about the Karak revolt uh, and 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 uh, and later on about all of the things that happened during that period, I would keep you here for another half an hour, and I don't think you want that. But the um, I completely take your point about uh, the the shift towards Arabism, and in fact, I also feel that it's no accident that the greatest resistance to the French colonialism actually ended up coming from the Hauran, from the Druze of Hauran, right? So that was, of course, uh, I think this was part of the tradition that they had kept going ever since Ottoman times. Uh, the Arab elite in this part of the world, of course, I mean, you, the, uh, the, general, uh, the general sort of um, uh, climate of, um, I guess, nationalism, you could call it, because Zayn Zayn and all these great men have written about it, uh, could indeed be, be, be studied, was indeed studied. But I think Shakib Arslan, in a sense, was pretty much, a, you know, he was pretty much of an exception. Uh, the fact that he was so, so, so attached to Jemaan and he came maintained, as you know very well, his Ottoman identity uh, when he had to flee Lebanon and he went abroad and he constantly campaigned, most violently, mostly, he hated two people the most. He hated Mustafa Kemal and Sharif Hussein for uh, for their for their uh, Mustafa Kemal for his Islamization and moving away from Islamic uh, Islamic uh, culture and Sharif Hussein for what he saw as treason. What Shakib Arslan saw as treason. So yeah, I mean, um, I, this is definitely uh, stuff that is being worth being um, uh, looked at. I don't know about lopsided. I think lopsided is a bit, uh, bit harsh. We make our choices when we write. We make our choices when we choose documents. I'm surprised that you could say that, Tarek. I think you've made some very nice choices in your part. Thank you. Oh, you are when you want to be. Um, well, first of all, I, again, uh, didn't have time to put in my paper, but uh, Dr. Abu Hussein published a big volume uh, of translated Ottoman documents uh, from, the, from the Ottoman archives relating to the Druze of Hauran, translated from Ottoman Turkish into Arabic. 
um, which uh, of course is a, a very a very great reference these days. Um, this issue of autonomy, uh, I wasn't aware of this law of 1848. I have to look that up. But the, uh, the, the whole issue of uh, Drew's autonomy doesn't really come up as Drew's autonomy. It comes up, this whole issue comes up as the autonomy, so-called autonomy of the Emirate as such. Okay? Because people keep saying that, you know, this is, uh, they, they, in fact, that's what Shekib Efendi comes up against. When he first tries to establish the uh, reglement of Shekib Efendi, he's coming up against this uh, demand for autonomy. And of course, this autonomy, so-called autonomy, was pushed the hardest by the French, because the French wanted a, a Maronite pro-French emirate. And this was their definition of autonomy, a Maronite pro-French emirate, which would be supposedly autonomous, but everybody knew that it would be basically just a French facade for their control over the mountain. So uh, the fact was that during the Hamidian period, there was this crackdown on what Istanbul saw, uh, the Hamidian regime saw, as all sort of dubious elements. And the Druze were just one of them. The fact that they were more prominent here in Lebanon for historical reasons, of course, meant that this aspect of the correction of the beliefs was uh, came out more to the fore here. The, of course, as I tried to mention very uh, clearly at the end of my paper, ultimately this was not successful. Nobody's beliefs were corrected. Or I mean, if people did choose to tend towards Sunni Islam, that was probably due to other considerations, political, economic, social, or otherwise. Okay? We have time for one last question. Thank you for your very interesting presentation. I'm uh -oh. probably difficult holding all the problems of the door. But just how could you please mention some that you mentioned Britain and what were the economic and to see so many of you here today, I would have thought most people would be too worried to come to a boring old talk on history when all this stuff is going on down the road. Um, as for the uh, economic aspects, again, I have to create time, uh, and I'm not an economic historian, by the way, but stealing wealth, it's about imperialism, Tariq, you should know about that, you're always going on about it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, particularly the silk industry. Uh, the French were the main uh, motor force be behind the silk industry, in partnership, actually, with the Maronites, mostly the Maronites. And, uh, and, and Lebanon, as we all know, was the major silk provider uh, for uh, the whole of Europe at that time. Um, do we see the resonances going on today? Of course. Of course. I mean, we... Uh, uh, myth uh, and are, are myth and they live because people want to believe in them. Right? In, in, in Israel, Israel, every Jew has the right to go back to his or her homeland. It's called making Aliyah, return. And it's a legal right for every Jew in the world. So it's based on this whole myth of Israel as the Eretz Israel, the land of the Jews. But you know, this is just too obvious. Uh, it's just too obvious a uh, case. Um, 